Welcome to Coffee and Campaign Building at PhD and D here on YouTube. It's been a while since I've done anything, so I'm excited to do this today. Hopefully we can get about an hour in here or whatever we need, but thank you for joining me. And we're going to get started. So with Coffee and Campaign Building, what I like to do is do some campaign building, prep, a lot of world building, show you how I do things. And it's a different way uh, instead of hearing a lot of, you know, this is how you should do this, this is how you should do that, which can be good, and I like that sometimes, but it's good to just see how someone else does it. And you can kind of form your own methods for campaign building, for world building, and use even ideas from this. Maybe you want to take one of these towns and use it for yourself, go for it. I don't have any grand dreams of publishing this campaign setting or anything, and I think you should take from wherever you can to get good ideas for your game. So without further ado, we are going to get started today. And I want to start, I've kind of got a list here of what I want to go through to keep me organized. And I want to recap kind of the campaign setting that I'm working on and how that's going to play into some games, how we've been using it already, so you can kind of get that idea. So to start off with, let's get a screen share going here. And if you've tuned in in the past, um, you may have seen the campaign setting um, known as AIR, A-E-R. That's what I like to use, um, or that's what I'm kind of building in this series here and working on. And again, I always forget the comment tracker, so give me one second while I open that. Okay, comment trackers up, and we're going to start a screen share of the campaign setting. Start screen share. And hopefully you can see this. This is a picture of air, the setting that I'm going to use, and the setting that I'm going to be building throughout the coffee and campaign building series. It's divided up into four areas, Melandia in the north, Asmar in the west, Norfar in the east, and Nalia in the south. The idea behind this setting is that Asmar and Norfar are kind of the two populated areas in the east and west, whereas Melandia is kind of the pinnacle of chaos and evil, and Nalia in the south is the exact opposite. Very good, very beautiful. Um, still, I guess, would be a little chaotic. Just think of, like, the Feywild... Um, or fey creatures, very natural place. But that is the setting. I'm adding more and more cities as I go, and I'll kind of highlight where some of those are. But I, what I want to do is use this in my next campaign, whenever that may be. Now, we've decided, kind of as a group, or I've kind of put the idea out there, that we're going to use the Forgotten Realms um, for one of our main campaigns coming up, just to kind of jump in with that. We've never done a whole lot with that. But we're also, in my other games, going to use air. So, with air, and with what I've been doing with it, I've had two campaigns that are playtesting D&D Next. And we're also kind of playtesting air, since it's a new world that's not finished. Not that, a, you know, in world building you ever actually finish something, but we're playtesting it far before I would ever want to fully run it or be ready to run this setting. So two locations, two prime locations that we've been using. I had one campaign with some guys online, and that one is no longer going on, and I'll explain that in a second, but we were in Cyril. I'll try to let you know where that is. So if you can see that little red circle down there, that is where Cyril is. And they were playing that. It was three other guys over Google Hangouts, and we were kind of playtesting down in that corner. And I'll show you that city in just a little bit and tell you a little bit more about it. But then I had my my roommate and I are actually doing a one-on-one -on -one campaign. It's the first one I've ever officially done and stuck with. One-on-one um, one -on -one meaning one dungeon master, one player. And I was always skeptical about those and hesitant to do one. And one evening I got on Facebook and talked with Ander Wood, uh, the main man, kind of about it and asked him some things and just in a brief talk um, he explained just how rewarding they can be and pointed me to some 
some advice on how to do that. And so I ran with it, and I've got to say it's been one of the most rewarding experiences in my history of gaming um, ever. So it's been a lot of fun. There's tons of role playing because this my roommate is actually in a lot of my other games, and he is one of the best role players of the group. So when it's just him, it's a lot of a lot of role playing, a lot less of the combat and casual style play, you could say. So he has been in the city of Manzir. And Manzir, kind of if you look towards the upper left, is right there. So they were kind of the two groups playing at the same time, or I'd play with him on Mondays and the other group on Wednesday evenings. And they were it's at the same time, and my plan was to eventually have them kind of meet each other and form one group to kind of work together. But the Wednesday night group kind of fell off. There was uh, a lot of things that weren't lining up just as, you know, outside of game. Um, some attitude things and just general things that they weren't meshing for anyone. It was no one's fault at all. We just weren't meshing. We knew it, so I just kind of cut that game off for now. Um, we do a lot better in person with that group, so we'll meet every two, uh, every month and a half or so to play our fourth edition campaign, which isn't very often, but it's fun. So we stopped that group, so now it's just my roommate doing a one-on-one -on -one play testing this world, and he's in Manzir. He actually just left there. But those are two locations that are actually very well developed, and I can show you and tell you a little bit more about um, how those came to be developed and how playtesting actually furthered that development. So we'll start with Cyril, and we didn't play very many sessions with that group, but I'm going to put up a picture. Well, first I'll explain. I like to take pictures I find online, uh, fantasy settings that someone either drew or took from somewhere else, and I like to let that inspire me um, on how a location's going to look a lot of times. So I've taken these images and built the city to look very similar to those images. I'll put up Cyril so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, here is the picture of Cyril, and or at least what inspired me with Cyril. On our Obsidian Portal homepage for this campaign or this world, it uh, this is what will show up if you go to the Cyril page. Anyone that uh, wants to see it in the campaign, and on that page I list certain things, uh, population, defenses of a city, things that characters would normally know so they can go have access to that information. But you can see how this is a very cool looking city. I kind of liked the different glowing colored lights everywhere and the architecture fit perfectly for what I wanted Cyril to be. So I have in my mind a very loose idea of a city. I'll go online, look up just fantasy settings or fantasy cities. I'll use some of the websites I've talked about before to, and I can post that again if anyone needs me to, but to find something that fits close to that. And this fit very closely with what I wanted for Cyril. So then I take this and use it for inspiration. So it's kind of a double process there. I've already got inspiration. Then I go find a picture, which just enhances that. So this is the city of Cyril where the online group was playing. Now if you look uh, closely at the map, and you can go back and look at that sometime, there is kind of a uh, an area called the a Azure, Azure um, which has two or three cities in it, which is kind of a valley, and I'm starting to differentiate regions. Not now, I've had Norfar, Asmar, the big, big regions, but even within that, you've got little regions that start, which is kind of fun as well, having different cultures in different areas like that. So let's screen share, let's go to Manzir, which is where the one-on-one -on -one game is right now. It's a very dark place because it's on the edge of Melandia, which is that terrible, terrible north or northern area. So you notice on the map that it is kind of on a lake, which is still unnamed, by the way. Just 
goes to show you don't have to name everything immediately. We just came up with the name of the river that leads in there uh, being the God Flow, so we're coming up with a name for this lake. But this is Manzir and the view looking towards the lake. Now I want you to look at kind of those rocks that the city's built into, those giant rocks. There's no other way really to put it. They're kind of these mounds. So what I've done is I've created kind of a city layout based on those mounds, using it as inspiration, which I'll show you now. You can kind of, you'll kind of be able to see it. But the city's built into that. And so I take that for the player, or for the players, and this will be a lot more fleshed out when I start. But I don't even know if you can see this. There's kind of the water that was in the picture. There's those sharp rocks. And then there's these giant, whoops, these giant kind of mounds. Here's a more detailed one right there that the city's built in and built around. So I can point to where things are in the city and sort of draw this out as they're playing, or they can draw it out and figure out where different places are within that city. So Manzir, the one I just showed you, and Cyril, the one right before that, are two of the more developed cities just because we have been playtesting them in the game. Okay, so with those, um, how I've developed them, each city before I started, I developed a couple of NPCs in each city to start with and then used tips from uh, Sly Flourish's Lazy DM book to actually run those games. And if you may have seen that on other channels, a lot of people are starting to discover that book and how much help it is to actually get you to use your time more wisely. Some people say, well, I don't want to be a lazy DM. I want to, you know, I like doing all the extra hard work. And that's fine. This book just shows you what you want to spend all that extra time on. It shows you how you get the actual details that are needed to run a game, the bare bones. Get those done quickly so that when you have extra time, you can do all the rest. So 3 by 5 cards are the tool of choice for that. So what I did was I had a couple of NPCs on a card. So say three NPCs on a card. These three NPCs with a little snippet about them, usually what they've been up to. That's what I like to put on there. And I'm going to build an NPC in just a second to show you again how I build an NPC, a very quick outline. But, for instance, these three guys and what they're up to, I already had prepared. And you will start to see that one of the things in the outline I use to build NPCs is an ally. You could even put, go so far as to put an enemy of an NPC. But once you put an ally, so, for instance, Aiskin is the head of the Adventuring Guild in Manzir. He's the top one on here. He has two allies, Tan Silverthrong, which is a blacksmith in Manzir, and he's also friends with the Lord of Manzir. And just by creating him, just by creating Aiskin, I now have two others, two allies, and I can go flesh them out. We have three NPCs after just fully creating one. Then I can go into each of the others. So let's go into the blacksmith, Tan, for instance. And I can write down two of his friends, or two allies, as I like to word it. His two allies are this person and this person. Now you've got some more. And see how it just kind of spirals from there. So one of the really cool things that I just saw the last time we played is my player was just about to leave Manzir for the first time to actually go to another city. He's been in and around Manzir, but he was going to go to Cordier's Coast, which is over kind of on the side. It's quite a ways away. Let me put up a screenshot. Quite a ways away, but he was headed to Cordier's Coast because that's where he had a ship that was going to take him all the way around air down to Cyril on the bottom right. So Cordier's Coast on the far western side. And he was talking to Aiskin the head of the Adventuring Guild. Now, Aiskin just happened to have one of his allies, or not even one of his allies, actually. This was in his background. In his background, there's a guy named Cax Mergen, which was the old Adventuring Guild leader. So he kind of took over for this guy. This guy retired and went to Cordier's Coast. And I just kind of had that as, you know, some flavor to have in the guy's backstory. Well, 
when my player went up to him and said, hey, I'm going to have to leave for a while. I'm headed to Courtier's Coast to, you know, sail to this other place. So I'll be back. Thanks for everything. All of a sudden, I had some connections being made, and Aiskin said, hey, you know what? Um, I actually have a really good friend in Courtier's Coast. And that doesn't seem like a lot to some of you, but he actually did. You know, this guy, yeah, he doesn't exist. Sure, it's fantasy world. But this guy that I created actually did know someone there. Not just for a story line, not just to further some plot device or something. He actually knew someone who lived there and had a really good reason to know him. So it was just really cool for me. And I think I, I role-played it better than ever because I realized it as I was uh, role-playing him. I said, hey, you know what? I actually have a friend there you should talk to. Uh, go see him. Stay with him. Tell him I sent you. It was just really cool to see that. That is the world starting to be connected, starting to come together, and that's where the enjoyment really comes out, as well as the immersion of thinking this is a realistic world, or realistic enough, plausible, whatever you want to use. So that was a lot of fun to kind of realize that. So next up, hopefully I didn't leave anything on a loose end, we're going to build an NPC. So, clear my stuff here. I'm going to put up a screenshot of the NPC outline I use. If you ever want a copy, email me at dmprofessor227 at gmail.com. Hit me up on Facebook, send me a message on YouTube, whatever, and I can send you this. It's very simple. It doesn't take very long, and it creates a very well-rounded NPC. So let's put this up. And if I didn't say earlier, make sure you go ahead and get a coffee. This is coffee and campaign building here. So, creating an NPC outline. And I hope you can see all this, but I'll kind of go through it bit by bit. I've done it before. We're going to create an individual. I've got him on one of my cards here that my player just joined. This is the guy he's going to Courtier's Coast with. This is going to be a fellow adventurer. A uh, sailor, fighter guy. His name is Brimden Balakash. So I'm going to go ahead and change the very top of this to Brimden Balakash. And I apologize if the typing is very loud. hope you can still hear me. So I like to start with, and you can see under there, it's combined method using wizards. Uh, Dungeon Master's Guide and the Game Master Guide from Paizo. Start with an occupation. Describe the character's way of life and their occupation. I know for a fact that Brimden is a sailor. He's actually the first mate aboard a ship, I believe, which is called the Mediate. So that is his occupation. Now, having an occupation gives you 90% of what you need because it gives you usually what this person is going to be doing all the time, or it gives you certain skills they're going to have. Uh, maybe even what they look like. This kind of builds off into everything else. So Brimden, Sailor, first made aboard the Mediate. We go into physical description. Um, short summary of the NPC's appearance. So here you can get as detailed as you want. You could create, you know, a flowery words that you are going to use or actual, like, read aloud text that you're going to read straight off of. I'm just going to say he's broad-shouldered, well-muscled, He's got almost glowing red hair with a full red beard. And you can go into detail what they're wearing at the time, what they're usually wearing, but I'm not going to go into that with him right now. So attributes and skills. You want to note some skills and abilities that stand out for this NPC. This is actual skills that you're going to find on their character sheet maybe actual abilities, you know, he has a very high strength score, for instance. Um, or you can leave it a little more vague and just say, like for him, I'm going to say very strong and hardy skills. Um, he's got plenty of skills in sailing. So sailing skills and with him, anyways, he is a fighter, and I know this as I'm building him. So he's also 
got skills or he's skilled with a battle axe. Now these are just very, very simple, very basic things that I'm writing down here. You can obviously go much more in depth with these as you see fit. But going through it quickly, you can kind of see just how quick this can be and how detailed at the same time. Values and motivations. What motivates this guy? What does he value above everything else? Well, Brimden has sort of, he's got a dream where he actually wants to own his own ship. Now, he's never even been close to that. So what motivates him? Money. I'm going to say he values freedom and the open sea wants his own ship. That's where the money thing comes in. You could also put things like friendship here. He values friendship. Um, other things that could motivate him, you know, adventure could motivate him. A personal thing from his background, which we'll get to in a second. But quick values and motivations. Behavior how they interact with individuals and relationships. This is one to definitely not skip. I wouldn't skip any, but definitely not this one, because you want to know how do they interact with people. Um, his behavior, he's a salesman. That's what happened when my, uh, when my player met him. He was trying to s talk people into coming aboard their ship. They needed people to help them sail across to Cyril, so he's kind of that salesman behavior. So I'm going to write salesman, with new relationships. Although, once he gets to know you with actual friends, he is very considerate. Very considerate person. Considerate with close friends and calm. And I say calm because I know he's very outgoing and very loud with new people, with his whole salesman attitude. So, useful knowledge. Anything that he would have that could help the player characters further the plot line or further the story. So useful knowledge with him, he's going to know a lot about the waters around air. Around air, as well as pirates sailing and trade over water. He's familiar with all that, and those are things that I think player characters could go to him for. So mannerisms. Now, I'm going to take a second here with mannerisms because I have my adventure building binder and I've got mannerisms and quirks in here. So I'm going to open that and kind of go through what I want for this. So as a mannerism for him, and mannerisms and quirks can kind of be interchanged. Use them however you want, but this is something memorable about this NPC that they're going to remember. So maybe even something as simple as spits a lot when he talks. Just saliva everywhere. And if, if you want to do that as an actual game master, more power to you. You want to spit on your players, they might not like that, but that could certainly enhance immersion. So I'll leave it at that. Alignment. This I recommend actually choosing something. Um, now this guy is very, um, I'm going to say chaotic good, just based on what I know about him. And you can leave it at that. Choose the alignment that you want to have them follow, or choose even a range. Like, you know, he tends to be here, he tends to be here sometimes. Maybe you don't want to pin him down right away. Ally. Talked about this earlier. Who do they trust? Who their best friend? Note some allies. Another step not to skip because this furthers your world building and gives you more NPCs to work with. So this guy right here. Captain Armitash. Captain Armitash is the captain of their ship. And I spelled captain wrong. Captain Armitash. Captain of the ship, very good friend of his, and now I've got another NPC that I can use. Another one, he actually is good friends with somebody in Cyril, uh, halfway across the world basically at this point or across this continent um, and he is friends with oh his name's Sander I forgot his first name already um, but he's friends with Sander and Cyril Lord Sander 
So now I've got two NPCs in different locations that this guy is friends with. And I have reasons in my head why he's friends with them. If you want to put that here, go for it. Um, otherwise, you can just list them. But now I've got two other NPCs at least starting to be created. Background, note at least a significant couple of events from their past. So, ship sank, has a kid, scarred by this, won't sail, near shallow water at all. So that's a simple one right there, very simple. Um, other background things with him, he actually came from Estonia. during, let's call it, the Vampire Wars. And that's not even a real thing right now, but if it was and I knew more about it, we've got something for him now that can kind of influence how he grew up or how he acts towards, say, vampires or anything I know about Estonia, which is my other campaign uh, area right now, um, that could influence him as a person here and make him stand out. This is a good one. List one object that is in possession that sets him apart. It can be known to other people. It can be secretive. Um, but when they have something that's completely theirs, it sets them apart from just a cardboard cutout NPC. So, for instance, some of my other guys, one of them has the key to the Adventuring Guild uh, safe, basically, where they hide all sorts of really good stuff. One of the NPCs in this game has has a rock that is very, very rare from another location. So what we can say for him, uh, known or secretive, we can say that he has perhaps a, let's take a creature for instance. So he has a dead dragon. That's extreme, but somewhere, maybe in his house, uh, he has a baby dragon that he f maybe even just found, but it was dead. And he kind of keeps that, and it hasn't completely... Um, so either rotted away yet, or maybe it's magic enough that it's not going to. So I'm going to write that down. Dead baby dragon, which sounds horrible, but it's very interesting. And that could create even more story or plot lines if you want to make that a public thing among your players. Quirks, like mannerisms, they should set this NPC apart and make them memorable. They add personality. So a quirky thing for him, perhaps for being so brute and... Uh, unrefined as most people would probably pin him down. Maybe he uses very flowery speech with long drawn out words. Confuses most people. That's not good if he's trying to be a salesman, but maybe he's trying to use words to sound fancy. Uh, he's just beyond himself. So just another quirk that you can use to make him stand out. Secret list a secret that they hold. I try to make this different than their object. So yes, maybe the dead baby dragon is a secret, but try to have another one. So maybe they were in a city and he got in a fight, let's say, he beat up a bunch of orphans who were trying to steal his food. Another grim picture, but he's, maybe he's a good guy, and that just haunts him that he did that, that he flipped out and just went after them. Maybe that haunts him all the time, so now he's really, really nice to the poor and to children, and that can define him as a person. Maybe no one ever finds out why, but, again, we don't want to create cardboard cutouts that are just there to serve the PCs in whatever they're doing. You want to create people that kind of have their own motivations and goals. You hear it all the time. It's just another way to do that. Voice. This is where you just make a quick note to yourself at what type of voice, what you're going to do for their voice. So for him, I could say gruff and stick out bottom jaw. So you stick out your jaw and get a really gruff voice. So I know every time I'm going to play him exactly what his voice is because I'm infamous for, or I'm, oh, it's just terrible. I'll forget a person's accent super quick if I haven't played them very many times. Like we have a running joke, Tan Silverthong I was talking about earlier, 
he is the man of many accents because I cannot pin him down. So right there, you go through those simple things. That is my NPC outline. It doesn't take long. I even drew that out a lot longer than it had to be. And you've got a very well-developed NPC. You've also expanded your world building by maybe the events that you wrote here, or the objects, certainly by the allies because you've added more NPCs to the mix. And I would say for every NPC you create, one of the two allies that you list, or one of however many you list, should be someone brand new. Don't trap yourself in a loop by just naming people you've already created. Um, unless you have literally created hundreds of thousands of NPCs and your world's completely finished. Always try to have at least one new one to keep building and keep going. So, that is the NPC outline that I use, and now I've created Brimden Balakash, the fighting sailor who is going to take my player halfway around the world. Uh, my player's going to spend a lot of time with him, so it only makes sense that I fully have him developed to be able to role play and have fun with. Okay, moving on. What I'd like to do next is sort of build a, uh, a community or a town. And this town, I'm going to tell you how it's created. I had a player go to a masquerade. This individual went to a masquerade for a very rich guy. Um, masquerades, you know, a lot of a double dealing is a lot of secretive things going on because everyone's wearing a mask and it's very easy to get away with these things. He went in there and I had a couple, there's an article Wizards posted about how to run a good masquerade and a couple of the wild card NPCs, they call them, people who can introduce new plots and new things. I, I wanted to have a couple of them present options to him. So he looked, he was looking for somebody that was standing out in the crowd and there were a few guys. One of them one of them named Brandon Wellstrom. Brandon Wellstrom uh, was wearing a dragon mask, and he was looking for a companion, someone who was comfortable in the wilderness, to kind of guide him to a city called Windgate. Because, well, we don't know why. He was just he was talking to people about that and attracting a lot of attention. And why it was attracting attention is because of some recent events that happened in Windgate. But this was a name I came up with on the fly, and now I've got a city I need to create because this guy exists and was wanting to go there. So, the other one was Brimden Balakash, who we just created. He was trying to be a, his salesman self and hire sailors or hire people to go around. He's wearing an eagle mask, and so these are how these are some ideas. And my player at first met Brandon and wanted to go to Wingate really bad. He's like, "Oh yeah, it sounds sounds like fun." I'm going to go there. But then the guy who runs the masquerade, or ran it, turns out he's based on Xanatos, which if you watch Gargoyles and have watched my very first NPC All-Stars, I think, was him. Um, he's always got ulterior motives to help himself. He's one step ahead of the PCs all the time. He wanted this player to get to Cyril. He's like, you need to deliver this package to Cyril. Um, I'm going to pay you more than you could ever imagine as a level one or two player to do this, to make it very tempting. And this guy's super wealthy, so it could work. So he decided to do that, and he's like, well, can't go to Wingate anymore, um, so I'm going to go with that Brimden guy and sail all the way around to Cyril. So that's how all those plot lines came up. That's how Wingate was even created in the first place. But, once again, those were all on that 3x5 card, which you learn in Sly Flourish's Lazy DM. But we're going to try to create Wingate here. I'm going to pull open a file that I use. It is a very, very short outline uh, for creating a place. And I'm going to see if I even have it. I might not even have it here. But when you create um, places, you just want at least the very basics uh, at hand or ready. So, you know, defenses, how the places run, like government, the, the uh, what, commerce, the economy in the town, um, and then some some factors that stand out, and it looks like I don't have that available. So we'll talk about it. But 
I'm going to pull up the map again and show you where Windgate is so you can have an idea what we're working with, what area we're working with. Windgate. Okay, so from Manzir, one of his offers was to go to Windgate, which doesn't have a little dot yet, but is right here in the center. It's that red circle nearest the center. So it's in between two rivers. It's just south, or just north of some of these smaller mountains in that mountain range, and that's what we're working with. But you'll see how I stick with the very, very basics when creating a location. So, first things first, we need to talk about the name of it, which we've got. We've got Windgate. Next, how big is this place? Population. You can look in you know, rule books for certain systems. They'll give you recommendations on how big a place should be or what things they'll have if they're this big, You know, what things are included if they're even bigger or smaller. So, this place is not going to be huge. I want probably a thousand or two thousand people which isn't isn't tiny for a fantasy world um, I want them in the area maybe not within Windgate but farms around it maybe it's a farming community uh, defenses next we talk about defenses they're gonna have very they're gonna have a city wall but very very small uh, maybe even wooden who knows very small defenses they've got a city guard which is mostly made up of volunteers so it's going to be you know carpenters blacksmiths um, hunters and they kind of do rotations there consider it like uh, and they're I want to say they're very well respected as well um, I've always had a huge personal respect and this is some inspiration here I've always had a huge personal respect for volunteer firefighters for what they put themselves out there for and I don't know. That's going to be my inspiration for the City Watch here. Just a bunch of guys that are highly respected because they put in the time to guard this city when they don't have to. And it's not going to be a great defense. Um, any major place that wants to come invade is going to be able to, but they can keep out, let's say, orc tribes or goblin tribes from the mountains or, you know, any most things that are found in that area they can defend themselves. That's why there's a city there and it hasn't been destroyed yet. Next let's talk about the government. The government and how they work within air. You have the Emperor at the very top. You have the Lord Warden. Say that too quickly and it becomes a joke. But you have the Lord Warden of different areas. The four major. So you have the Lord Warden of Asmar. You have a Lord Warden of Norfar and so on. Um, so that guy is not located here, but then you break it down into smaller areas and there's going to be just a lord who kind of provides a lot of the money, provides the connection to the higher government, um, the communication to them anyways. If the city needs something, they go to him, he goes to the person above him, makes requests, and so forth. But he lives in town, perhaps in a keep, a small keep, keeping everything running in this city. Then you want to think about the commerce trade, things coming in and out of this city. So looking at the location on the map, there's nothing really to the south of it. Uh, Nalia, there's not a lot of cities that interact with regularly in Nalia. And you got the mountains there, so we've got trade, probably a good deal of trade coming from Manzir in the north, and to the left, let me pull that up again, just leave it up so you can see it. To the left is where the uh, basically the capital city of air, and I'll circle that one now, Adalor. That's where the emperor is. A lot of trade is probably coming between the two of these and from those other cities along the river. Port cities, where the river feeds into the ocean, you get a lot of trade from other continents that travels up river, and the last stop, because technically the city's not on that river, the last stop is they probably take stuff here take stuff to Windgate. So with the commerce, you or with the trade and stuff, you can get most things here. Um, there's a very low magic setting, so actually magic items. Um, you can't just go around and buy. Uh, so you can get most goods for, you know, clothing, food, but they're not going to have any luxuries here. Only the maybe one or two super rich families here have 
got stuff from other locations. Maybe they went and traveled or journeyman brought the stuff. So you can get mostly what you need to survive here and live a decent life, but you're not going to live in luxury in Wingate. Have an idea about that economy there. Have an idea about the defenses, like I talked about, and have an idea about the government. Those are some major ones. Of course, size of the city being the first thing you should determine. But that's kind of the process I go through to have a city ready. And I actually write it down normally. I'm sorry I didn't have an outline ready for that. But I record it on Obsidian Portal. I'll make a page. I'll list those things. And on OP, you can actually have an, uh, a section where it's GM only. So anything beyond that that the players wouldn't readily know or wouldn't readily be able to ask about, I'll put that in the GM only section. So maybe there's an evil plot in Windgate. Well, the incident was that the Lord's son was murdered. So details about that keep hidden. All you really need is that those main things though to make a settlement. That's the bare bones that you need. Um, I have guilds, so I would want to know what guilds uh, have housings there and so forth. And then create some NPCs. Uh, use the rule of three that I've talked about where I'll go in, say, with Windgate, and I'll start with three NPCs. Just three main NPCs, put them on a 3 by 5 card, and then use the allies that you've created for each of those to further fill this city with people. With three NPCs, you can have three adventuring locations. Grab another 3 by 5 card. Put those on there. So there's three locations near Windgate with possible adventure sites. So let's face it, they're going to be adventures in fantasy games. And just go from there. Spawn more and more. So maybe each location has three NPCs that know about it. And you come back and create even more NPCs. So just use that rule of three. Bounce back and forth to different things. And pretty soon you've started very small and started to create a very full city from that. And it's not wasting a ton of your time. You don't have to sit down and draw a map of the entire city, lay out every street. Now, I'm not bashing that. I love doing that myself, but I prefer to do that later on once it's kind of built itself through the actual gameplay. Um, I'd much rather have that done later on than have it prepared before we ever sit down and play. I want to know what's in that city, and I've got an idea, but let what happens in the game determine exactly where things are and what that final map is going to look like. So that's how I kind of build settlements and towns like that. So I'm going to kind of wrap up the campaign building part there today. I wanted to build a person, and I wanted to build a location and then talk about kind of my thought process for how I've gone about this place, how I've had two teams play testing different areas, and how building in one area, like like I said, can influence tons of stuff in the other areas. So, like, for instance, when he found out he had an ally in another town, now the world's becoming connected. So I wanted to show that today. And the last couple minutes here, I'll either take questions, if there are any posted, or I'm going to talk just a little about the direction of the channel and some upcoming things. I'll take about five minutes to do that here. So, I have had a lot less content out, and I apologize for that. This is usually a downtime of year that I was hoping to get more content out, but we've been busier probably than we have been all year, which makes no sense to me. But life happens, so I'm going to get content out as I can. I've got some a list here of things that I want to get out very soon. Uh, two more videos in the Moving Forth Skill Challenge series. Uh, looking at skills in a different light is one of them. And then the final, Performing with Better Skill Challenges, being the last video in that series. I also want to continue to do some more coffee and campaign buildings as I can. Uh, NPC All-Stars, I've got a couple ideas for those, so we'll have those coming out. And I want to go back through the Adventure Creation Binder which influenced by DMJ, I've kind of made, I had what he had, and then I've added some tools and things that I've found since then. So it's, I want to do an updated adventure creation binder because on every channel that does one of these, it's, it's always very popular. People like to see, they like to see things. They like to have ideas for things they can directly take. So hopefully get one of those out soon. 
and continuing with other stuff. Uh, I want to get some responses in the community. I know Samuel G had a video um, on character death that had just a huge response. Uh, video responses left and right. It's really cool to see that again. It's been a while, I feel like, since I've seen a lot of that interaction. So I want to try to get involved with some of that. Um, so videos coming as I can get them out. Winter, it's always better to get stuff out anyways. But I will have stuff. I'm going to try at least to get something every week or every other week out. So for now anyways. Other things. If you're not following me on Facebook, I would recommend it just from the standpoint of when I can't get content out, that is where I'm going to be the most active. That's where if I find a cool resource, I'm going to post it. Or that's where I'll talk and interact with people from the community when maybe I don't have time to put together a video and edit that. So head over to Facebook and find PhD and D because that, and I have two, I have PhD and D as a page that you can like. And then you may see one that says Kirk, Ph.D. and D as a person. I don't use that one much. That's for some side projects. So feel free to add me on that. I'll add you back. But I don't use it very much um, for interaction anyways, unless it's those projects. So head over there to stay more interactive with it. And I'm also working on a website, which just through one of those free website builders, I found a good one that actually looks decent. And I'm going to finish the pages on there and then publish that very soon, uh, probably within the next week or two. And that's going to be, at least right now, I'm going to put up downloads, links to other sites with really cool RPG material. And the hopes are to, and I've talked with some people, and give me your feedback, what do you want to see on the website? But it's going to be, you know, adventures. I want to write some adventures and put them up. I want to put up pictures for inspiration, some works on air is a setting, uh, so maybe you can take some of that, maps and things, um, just a bunch of things, or even highlight work that other people have done. If you draw a dungeon and you want to put it up for people to download, let me know, and I can highlight it on there. But I want to get a good website going where we can put up a lot of these resources in one place. So that's what I'm going to do uh, very, very soon. I've actually been working on it every single day for the past couple of days, at least a little bit. So I do have a question here from the Swamper. Do you create multiple cities and fill them with some NPCs and adventures before game session one? Or do you detail one heavily and the others only a little bit until needed? Okay, so, and I assume you're talking about game session one, the very, very first game session. I like to come up, first of all, in my head with how's it going to start. I don't like the, you know, the, tried and true, you meet in a tavern and you see some other guys and somebody wants you to go on an adventure. Um, not, I'm kind of getting sick of that because I've used it too much. So how's it going to start is what I personally start with. And then I will create, and I've been using that lazy DM technique lately where I'll just have that loose outline of the city in my head and then just three to five NPCs on a note card uh, with something important about them, something they've been doing or possible adventure seeds that the PCs could run into. And I like to do that versus having tons of cities with multiple NPCs. But, like I said, with the method of three, and I hope I'm not confusing you here because I'm back and forth, with the method of three, if I'm in a city, so city A, I've got my three to five NPCs, and then on a different card, I've got three or so adventuring sites. If those are another city or something, then I would have about three more NPCs for that city. Um, if they're not another city, then I don't worry about it. I try to just keep them... I try to not let uh, players go too far on their first session, uh, but if there's a, a town or city nearby where they could possibly go for an adventure, then I will have at least three to five NPCs ready in my head um, and as always, they're going to throw some of your plans off and you're going to have to improv NPCs, which is kind of fun for me as well. So I only do, I don't detail anything heavily and at least with from that NPC side, I'll detail each one pretty heavily, but only about three to five NPCs. Just so it's more of so I feel prepared. Because um, when you can calm down as a game master... I find that I can run stuff a lot smoother. If I 
in my head have, you know, 20 NPCs, but I haven't written a thing down, I'm panicking. I just, I don't feel prepared. So that's how I handle it, at least, uh, with that. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and with that, I'll kind of wrap up. Uh, if any other questions pop up, I will answer them with a text comment. I know there's a little delay here, so... Yep, head over to Facebook, uh, like it there so you can stay interacting even when there's not a lot of videos being put out. And stay tuned for this website, which I can hopefully get up. We're still working behind the scenes on getting the community fantasy-based RPG up as well. That's just taking just a little bit longer because a couple of us are very, very busy. But that is still happening. So this has been Coffee and Campaign Building. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, comment whenever you watch and I will get back to you as soon as I can. But other than that, hope everyone's gaming all weekend and have a great day.